Yeah. Hi, Renee. So, Hello, April, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, Marsh is somewhere around. We're both together on this on her screen. So Abraham Joshua Heschel portrayed the inhabitants of the shtetl as highly spiritual, pious Jews, genuine holy martyrs. Heschel never lived in the shtetl. <laughs> now, while he portrayed the Jews as a uh, very spiritual a uh, group of people, we're going to get a rounder, more fully nuanced picture of what life was like in the shtetl. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the dates between 1795 and 1850. Now, remember from last class, 1795, do you remember what happened in 1795? Partition. Partition, that's right. It was the third and last partition of Poland. And Poland ceased to be a nation, an independent nation after 1795. So, particularly the shtetl was an area that was part of Poland prior to 1795. The shtetl was a private town belonging to a local Polish landlord who lived on a manorial estate. And the Jews lived on the estate and lands around the estate owned by the Polish Horitz. That's what he was called. And the Jews who lived in the shtetl lived there in exchange for certain privileges. Basically, they existed to make the town prosperous. And I talked a little bit about um, one of the main things that Jews did in the shtetl was they managed the lands mm -hmm. between the uh, Polish poorets and the people who worked on the land. They ran the inns. They ran the, um, the saloons, the uh, places that the people stopped and ate. But they existed to make money for the Polish landlords. When the Pale of Settlement came to Russia after 1795, the Tsarist government did not change a lot of the arrangements. The Poles still maintained ownership of the land. And that didn't really change or begin to change until 1830, 1831. And that was, those were the two years of the Polish rebellion when Poland tried to break free of uh, the Tsarist empire. And that didn't sit too well with the Russians as can be expected. After the Polish rebellion, the Russians began confiscating all property from any of the Polish rebels and disloyal magnates. The land went to the Russian Ministry of Finance, who sold it to Eastern Orthodox, which would have been Russian gentry. And the Russians started to own the land that the shtetls were located on. Okay, so we have the time period and we have the beginnings of the change. So what was economics life? Economics life like in the shtetls? Well, in the Pale was a pre-industrial society. And while industrialization was taking place in Western Europe, it hadn't reached Eastern Europe yet. One of the things about a pre-industrial society is the relative scarcity of capital. Now we know that in Western Europe, Jews took a lot of entrepreneurial roles. In a pre-industrial society, there's not many roles for an entrepreneur to take. For one thing, there weren't a lot of heavy industry. The industry that was there 
was basically internal market. So internal market, the only things that the Pale of Settlement exported were grain and timber. And the Jewish role in the grain and timber industries was minimal. We'll get to that in a second. To give you some idea about how backward the Pale of Settlement was, I want to give you a statistic. Russia, as we know, is a huge nation. If you start at the Black Sea and head eastward to the Bering Sea, going across Russia, west to east, approximately how many miles from the Bering Sea, from the Black Sea to the Bering Sea, approximately how many miles is that across Russia? Anybody know? No. Okay. 6,000? About, about 5,100 miles, 5,100 yeah, miles. Yeah. Okay. Prior to the Crimean War, which ended in 1856, there were 1,300 miles of the circumference 5,100 miles, 1,300 miles in the entire country of Tsarist Russia. So we're not talking about an industrialized state at this point, are we? So what occupations did the Jews engage in? Mostly unskilled labor, trading, in grain and wood, and foodstuffs and beverages, and clothing and shoes. The major export from the Pale of Settlement were grain and wood. And the Jewish employment in the grain trade was relatively small. Grain was transferred, transported, I should say, by river, by boat, from the steppes to the ports of Gdansk and some of the German ports. And as far as wood, you had all the great forests in that part of Russia. The Jews did not own a whole lot of the sawmills, but did work as carpenters, cabinet makers, artisans, and traders. There were a few Jewish traders concentrated in the larger cities, but very few. To give you an idea, remember what I said the population was in the Pale of Settlement, 1.2 million approximately. There were only maybe 20,000 Jews who lived in Moscow and St. Petersburg at that time. The other thing that put Jewish entrepreneurs at a disadvantage was it was hard to raise capital within the Jewish community. Capital was scarce. Now, capital was not that free flowing either in the rest of Russia. Development in he the heavier industries, like for example, in coal and minerals and mining, was mostly foreign capital from Prussia and the Austro Hungarian Empire. So, once again, the Jews did not fulfill that middleman and entrepreneurial position as they did in many of the Western European countries and even in Poland. So what was a Jewish community like in the Pale of Settlement? The Jewish community was called the Kahila. Now the Kahila is of course Hebrew for community. And members who lived in the Kahila possessed a legal right of residence. Now that right could be gained by birth, by marriage, or formal application. Now if a Jew came from another place outside the Kahila, he or she had to demonstrate economic viability before they were allowed membership in the Kahila. Now this included, say for example, you married, uh, say this 
a person who owned a small shop in the shtetl married a woman who was outside the shtetl. And she wanted to move to live with her husband in the shtetl. And she had a sister who was a shopkeeper who also wanted to take residence. That sister not only had to demonstrate economic viability, but had to guarantee that she would not compete against the traders and the stores owned by Jews that were already in the community. So the Kihila regulated trade and kept a lot of the monopolies from the people for the people in the town. Now, what about the poor? Well, the poor were supported by the Kahila, but a lot of the poor in Eastern Europe, in the Tsarist Empire, were only allowed to stay. They would come to a town, were only allowed to stay for short periods of time. They were taken care of, they were given alms, but then they had to leave. And the, the time that they were allowed to stay changed from a few weeks to a few months, but they weren't allowed to become residents of the Kihila. Who ruled the Kihila? That was the Kahal, or the Jewish Community Council. What were the, Kah the Kahal's major powers? They were taxation, and adjudication. People who lived in a Jewish shtetl basically paid two kinds of taxes. One was based on an individual's capital and income, and the other was based on purchasing, on their consumption. So for example, when you wanted to go and get a chicken slaughtered, a kosher chickens, you know, a, a, a the chicken wasn't kosher. Well, it was after the rabbi decided it was. If you wanted to get it slaughtered according to kashrut, you had to pay a tax to the kahal in order to purchase the meat, make sure it was kosher. Now, adjudication includes summoning parties to the Jewish court, collecting fines, making regulations, punishing violators. Also, the Kahal administered religious, education, charity, economic, social institutions, including synagogues, the mikveh, and the cemetery. The local Kahal also cooperated with the Christian Magistrates Council in matters of mutual concern. So what would be an example of a matter of mutual concern between the Jewish and the non-Jewish community? Anybody have any ideas? If you had uh, disagreements between the, po the people around and the Jews, that would have to be taken care of. Yeah, but that would be settled by the courts. Which what, court? would be, what would be uh, an example of something that, that both Councils, the Magistrates Council for the non Jews and the Magistrates Council for the Jews. Construction, I don't know. What about, what about fire? Mm -hmm. What were the buildings made of, folks? Wood. 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 Okay. So fire was an ever present danger both to the Jews and the non Jews. And there was extensive cooperation between the two on issues like fire safety. There were Jewish and non-Jewish fire departments. And there was, there was a fire in town. Both came to help put out the fire. Also, Aaron, did they do, did the Jews do this on Shabbat? No. You know what, you know what? I, I shouldn't say no. I, I really, I don't know. They needed the non-Jews the non to do it so that hopefully they wouldn't uh, interfere with Shabbat. One would think so, but remember, the saving of a life overrides Shabbat. 
Uh, the, also, the, the prohibition is starting a fire. It doesn't, I'm not sure there's a prohibition on stopping. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think you're even allowed to carry certain things out during a fire. They're limited, but they're, you know, that's in uh, Tractate Shabbat. Are you, are you, now, you're, you're certainly allowed to be a fireman on Shabbat and save lives. There's no question about that. And imagine okay. people would let it yeah, go. should you, doesn't that fall within the category of saving? Well, it overrides everything else. I believe that they, I believe that they used the, in a shtetl, they, they used non-Jews, especially women, to stoke the fires in the bathhouses during Shabbat. Yes. Oh. That that's a regular, that's not like a fire that's a regular every week deal. Yeah, but, the, but you want to keep it hot. You don't want it to cool down during Shabbat. The same thing as in a bakery. Okay, so I'll bring them over. Would you cool it down because... Okay, we're going to mute everybody. We're hearing too many background noises here, folks. Thank you. So who could vote for the Kahal, the Jewish Community Council? Ladies, I'm sorry to tell you, it was only males. But it was not only just males, it was males who paid taxes at some minimum level. Okay? Those are the only ones who could elect officers or hold office. So the whole process of serving and voting on a community council was geared to ensure leadership. Well connected and learned members of the community. Now, there were other institutions besides the Kahal that were important in the shtetl. There were Havarot. There were two kinds of Havarot, trade guilds and mitzvah societies. Okay, trade guilds, what's an example of a trade guild? Well, for example, all the butchers in town belong to the butchers trade guild. The tailors belonged to their trade guild. Each trade guild regulated the profession in that particular town. They trained the sons of the members or the people who were coming into the profession. They established pricing so that nobody undercut anybody else or overcharged. They also established little Stiebelach where members of the guild worship together. And these Chavarot were a source of mutual support in times of need. There are also mitzvot Chavarot. Now these were members organized around a particular religious obligation, like burying the dead, providing dowries for poor brides, studying Talmud, now, just off the top of your head, I'm going to unmute you for guys for a second. What do you think the most powerful of the mitzvah societies was in the shtetl? Burial. 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 That. Sandy did. That's right, the Hever Kedisha. Okay, we'll mute everybody once again. The Hever Kedisha could threaten anyone living in the shtetl that if that family failed to comply with paying the fee for a burial plot, that family would be fated to be buried in an uncleaned place. The same for their children. And that was pretty serious business back in those days. So the Hever Kadisha was a very strong society and you made sure that you paid your membership dues and your taxes to the Hever Kadisha. Now we, when we look at movies like Fiddler on the Roof, we get the impression that Jews were powerless in the shtetl. That's not entirely true. First of all, limited power does not mean no power at all. Now, power implies certain communal privileges and freedoms. It also implies independence and self-respect. 
Now, relations between the Kahal and the Havarot, for example, and their members could flare up. And ordinary Jews did not give up easily the right to make their decisions and say their peace. So how was power enforced in the shtetl? Well, first of all, if there was a dispute between members of, oh, there was someone at the front door. Yeah. If there was a dispute between members, you could take it to the Jewish court. You could also take it to the Russian courts. Why would certain members of the Kahal take disputes to the Russian courts? Well, for one thing, is because if it was a poor man versus a rich man, the Russian courts were more objective than the Jewish courts many a time. They were slow, your case may not get heard for several months, but the Russian courts were often more objective. Power was enforced through the power of the Pinchasim. Does anybody know what a Pinchas is? I've heard that there's lots of feathers. No, nope, good guess, but okay, the Pinchas is the book of memory. It was a written account of the community's business and commercial transactions, the minutes, the records, the tax lists, who supported Torah education, et cetera, et cetera. But the Pinchas, as a book, permanent record that you were a member of this kahila, And if you ran up against the uh, powers that be in a shtetl, they could cross out your name until the dispute was settled or even erase your name from the Pinchas. And this was a very powerful, painful punishment for people who lived in the shtetl, the threat of erasing your name from the local Pinchas. There was also violence. Now we tend to think Jews as a pretty nonviolent people, especially in the shtetls. Well, remember in the last class I said in 1827, there was a statute on conscription of Jews to the Russian military. After 1827, there was a number of attacks on members of the Kahal by poor Jews throughout the Pale of Settlement. Why? Because poor Jews could not afford bribes, could not afford to pay someone to take the place of their sons. And as I said last week, for every thousand people on the tax roll in the shtetl, four to eight young Jews had to go into the Russian army every year. Now, there was a case in a uh, shtetl town of Staro Konstinovov, where the local Jews blamed the Kahal for failing to bribe Russian officials to circumvent the inclusion of Jewish youth in the conscription pool. And the local Jews attacked the houses of the Kahal members with such violence that the local police had to summon an army unit to suppress the violence in that particular shtetl. And that was not the only case of violence in the shtetl. There was also a violence that I call measure for measure. These were individual attacks of violence against Russians and Ukrainians. Now I'm gonna read you a little text from this book, Yonahan Petrovsky Stern's The Golden Age Shtetl. Petrovsky Stern went to the Ukraine, went to Poland, and went to Russia, and apparently he's fluent in all three languages, and looked at some of the archives in those languages about life in the shtetl, and that's what's in this book. And there's a particular instance that he writes about, about this Jew whose name was Morduch. Morduch was an experienced shtetl barber. The shtetl barber was also a doctor. 
who knew, among other things, how to treat venereal diseases. Morduk relied on the domestic help of those who he had cured for free, including Anna, a Christian lady. In 1824, right after a law was passed that forbid Jews from employing Christians as domestics, a local policeman, whose name was Kravchenko, Ukrainian name, came to Morduk to fetch Anna. Why should a Christian work for a Christ killer, he reasoned. The irate Morduk first cursed the policeman with such brutal words that according to Kravchenko, he could hardly stand on his own two feet. Then Morduk hit Kravchenko, grabbed him, lifted him up, and threw him into the street. When several policemen came to arrest him, Morduk refused to go to the local detention cell, and a whole bunch of policemen had to carry him to the cell in their arms. Unfortunately, the author doesn't go into uh, what happened to him, whether he went to a Jewish court or a Russian court. I would bet he went to a Russian court. And who knows what happened to him. But again, violence was part of shtetl life. Violence in that part of the country was and certainly in every week occurrence. At the end of the week, many of the non-Jewish peasants would get drunk, go into town, and pick fights with each other, especially the young people. Sometimes they brought weapons, which would include as deadly as knives, huge clubs, duke it out with each other. Sometimes they would take it out on the Jewish population. But violence was endemic in that part of the world. At the same time, there started to become cleavages between the Hasidic groups and the local Kahals. As Hasidim began to organize their institutions at the local level, this caused an exodus from the local communities, which became a threat through the local institutions. For example, if you, if you joined a local Hasidic court, you would no longer go and worship at the town synagogue. You'd worship at the Hasidic synagogue. And by attending, by not attending the local synagogue, you, knew, you no longer had to make your contributions, your donations to that synagogue. So the Hasidim caused the community financial damage. They also, the Hasidim, established Hasidic shtibelachs, which placed part of the community who worshipped there beyond the control of the Kahal. Eventually, the Hasidim demanded to practice their own ritual slaughter. This caused a big friction in the local community. Why? Because, as I said, one of the chief consumption taxes was on kosher meat. And if you're going to the local Hasidic butcher, not to the local town butchers to get your meat slaughtered. That's going to cause a problem. Eventually, the Hasidim sought to gain positions on the Jewish community boards themselves. Now, what's the difference between a shtetl and a shtot? Okay, and a dorf, as far as that's concerned. A dorf is the Yiddish word for village. Stot's probably bigger. No, a stot is bigger. Is that yeah, what you I, mean, I said? A stot is bigger. Stot is bigger. Mm -hmm. Stot is considered a city. A shtetl is considered a small town. Now, to amplify this, I'm going to read to you a text from Israel Axenfeld's novel, Dos Sterntichel, The Headband. The difference between a shtetl and a stot. Anyone familiar with our Russia, Russian Poland 
knows what Jews mean by a small shtetl. A small shtetl has a few cabins and a fair every other Sunday. The Jews deal in liquor, grain, burlap, or tar. Usually there's a man striving to be a Hasidic rabbi. A shtot, on the other hand, contains several hundred wooden homes and a row of brick shops. Therein are a very rich man, several well-to-do shopkeepers, a few dealers in fields, rabbit skins, wax, honey, as well as some money lenders who use cash either belonging to the rich man, who they go in the halves on the profits, or to tenant farmers, and tenant innkeepers in the surrounding area. Such a town has a Polish landowner, the Poritz. Poritz lives on his manor. Some prominent Jew who is held in esteem at the manor leases the entire town. Such a town also has a Jewish VIP who is a big shot with the district police chief. Such a town has an intriguer who is always litigating with the town and the Jewish communal administration. In such a town, the landowner tries to get a Hasidic rabbi to take up residence because if Jews come to him from all over, you can sell them vodka, ale, and mead. Such a town has a wine house with a wine house keeper, a watchmaker, and a doctor, a past cantor, and a present cantor a broker, a madman, and a guna, and is an abandoned wife, community beetles, those are the guys who go around the shtetl in the morning getting everybody to shul in the morning, a Talmud association, and a free loan association. Such a town has various kinds of synagogues, a shul mainly for the Sabbath and holidays, a base medrash for everyday use, and sometimes a cloisal, that's a smaller house of worship, or a shtibol, which is a small Hasidic synagogue. God forbid that anyone should actually blurt out the wrong word and call a shtot a shtetl. He'd be branded as a local smartass or a madman. One more thing I want to cover. I want to cover Yiddish curses. Now, <laughs> we may need a few of those these days. These days, for sure. We now, do need a few of those. Now, so put a we, link up to them. <laughs> we tend to think as Yiddish curses as coming from the Yiddish language. I'm going to give you a few Yiddish curses. Does anybody know what the word paskudnyak is? Paskudnyak is a scoundrel. No goodnik. No, no goodnik. Good you would say, Zoy a paskudnyak. What a scoundrel. Is it from the Yiddish or the Slavic? From the Slavic. What is a shkots? An unreliable person. Would, would that be like a shkots, a, a Gentile man? No. That shakets, shagets, plural, shkotsim. Yeah, that's a shagets. Right, that's a shagets. A shkots oh. is from the Russian word slots, which is a piece of cattle. So when you call somebody in Russian a slutz, you're referring to their bovine IQ. <laughs> What's a korva? A whore. Right. Who said that, Joyce? Yep. A what? Right. A korva is a prostitute or a whore. Mm -hmm. Is that a Yiddish word? Oh, yeah. I don't know. No, it's Ukrainian. 
Yeah. I learned it from my grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Here are their old Yiddish words. They have to be borrowed from another language, but they're <laughs> They, be, they became, yes, Marty, your point is well taken. They became Yiddish words. They came from Slavic, but they, were all, they all became Yiddish words. One of the things that Yiddish has a lot of curse words for people who are stupid or losers, including a bolvan, yolop, a zhlop, a chlop. We love these words, don't we? <laughs> now, do we know some people we can put these words to, or no, we're not going into that? Think of a we're not going into that. I think I'm a very good candidate. I could just see my children <laughs> saying, and mommy, what were you studying? I was studying these bad words. We're not allowed to say. <laughs> Those are the words my grandmother wanted to teach me. <laughs> That's right. Okay, folks. In the next lesson, in class number three, we're going to discuss how the shtetl started changing in the mid-19th century. And we're going to go into the 1880s, when the situation for the Jews in Russia started to become really bad and the great immigration started. Does anybody have any questions about the shtetl in Russia? Yeah. It sounds like they were paying enormous taxes. How did, were people, it sounded, was it very, very burdensome? Were they ever actually able to eat? Yeah, the taxes weren't burdensome. Because once again, when the local poets owned the shtetl, it was against his interest to overtax the Jews. Because he, you know, his Jews ran his estates, dealt with the local farmers, um, people who farm the land, and you're not going to put the people who run your business out of business with burdensome taxes. It only became later on when the Russians started taking over the you know, settlement, the taxes became burdensome. And again, we'll get to that next class next week. Aaron? Yes. With the, the various sizes, the names of the town or whatever, the whole list you went before, which I was not aware of, was there any kind of hard and fast or not even hard? I mean, how did you know what to call one thing and what to call uh, another? Good question. So I always I, ask good questions. <laughs> yes, you do. So I thought, basically... It had to do with size of the population. But from what I've read, that's not exactly true. The area. First of all, it was more to do with the size of the economic activity mm -hmm. in the towns. So there were small towns, for example, with only maybe 5,000 people total. And by the way, most of these towns were about 50% Jewish. Okay, Jews were about half of the population in most of the shtetl. The town may, may have been as small as 5,000 people, but if it had a very active fair, and remember the fairs were... The, every other week. Yeah, every other week. Some were once a month in the smaller towns, but again, every other week or weekly in some of the more prosperous towns. That's really what distinguished a prosperous shtetl from a poorer one, not the size of the population. And of course, the, the, more, the larger the fair, the more profit would be made, both by the poorets, the Jews, and the non-Jewish traders, because there were non-Jewish traders at these fairs also. Next question. Um, yeah, Aaron, I have a question. You talked about the, um, the method of recording um, the Book of Memory. Pincus. Uh, the Pincus. So uh, did that 
continue on into the 20th century, number yes. one. Number two, yes. were births, were births recorded in the pink house? Good question. I don't know if births were recorded. That I do not know. So I don't know exactly how it was used, Aaron, but the word pinkas is simply the Hebrew word for a notebook. Yeah, it, exactly. It is the word for notebook. But it's... The reason I ask is yeah. the, the authorities needed some way to, to know who, uh, I'm talking about the non-Jewish authorities, which, kid, which young people were um, draftable. So they needed to go to, they needed to have some record books. So I am wondering if they went to the, the, the Pinkas or no. the authorities had some other. No, no, uh, no. They, the Russians left it up to know. the Kahal. They gave each community, according to their tax records, mm -hmm. a, um, a number of draftees every year that had to come from that local community. And it was left for the Kahal to mm -hmm. fill that quota. But the Kahal needed a record. Was that record coming from the Pinkas? As far as that, I can't tell you for sure. Okay. But I imagine, look, the Kahal in most of the uh, shtetls, they knew everybody who lived in the shtetls. Okay, it wasn't like, you know, Houston. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say one more thing. The reason I ask is my, my grandfather used to, to delay telling the authorities, and that's why I'm asking the question, when he had a, a, a child. And so he would wait until the child, one of them was my father, was two years old before recording the, the birth of the, the child. So if any of them were, were snatched, they would be a little bit stronger. They were really old. two years older. So I was just wondering where my grandfather might have gone to, to record that's, those births. That's interesting. Oh. Yeah. You know, um, you asked a question about the, the, was the Pinkas or the Pinkasim, did they go into the 20th century? Mm -hmm. I have not investigated that. But one thing I do know that certainly in Poland, the pink house became the Yiskor book. Yeah, memorial book. Yeah. Oh, memorial books okay. in many communities. Okay. Of going from recording the living to recording the dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was like it's kind of like the county clerk does here, births and deaths. Mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, no. I can't give you a a, a definitive yeah. answer. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Do you know any books that have a lot of Yiddish curses? <laughs> <laughs> Weedy, just <That's> it's me. <laughs> Levin write a book with, with uh, a lot of Yiddish curses in it. Michael Wex did. How about the joys of Yiddish? The joys of Yiddish has a lot of this That's stuff. What I'm thinking of. The joys of Yiddish would have curses? Yes. yes. Sorry, I'll read it to you tonight, later on. <laughs> <laughs> we have the joys of Yiddish. I will look it up. Well, I'll tell you guys one. You're going to, Glory, you're going to be using it? You bet. Yeah, the best ones were not necessarily the dirty words as much as, may an onion grow in your puppet. You know, right. I, I could never memorize the Yiddish for that. Mm -hmm. Peter, what, what was yours? May all the teeth right. you know, <laughs> fall out but one and that should stay for a toothache. <laughs> <laughs> is that, uh, is that again? What was that? The, all the May teeth? all the t teeth in your mouth fall out but one and that should stay for a toothache. <laughs> Perfect. Those are wonderful. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Can anyone yes. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The name Pinkhus. I know people who have that name. Why would they be named Pinkas after a notebook? What kind of a... Because there's a Pinkas in the Bible. Pinkas is in the Bible. And what... Okay. Yes. So it has, no, it has no relationship to the notebook. Pinkas and Pinkas. 
Yeah. That's right. He, he, he uh, kills the Bible. a man and, his, yes. and a woman at the same time. Okay, so I'm going to pass along. Yeah, I think that the name Pinchas, Pinchas is really Pinchas, which, as you know, it's in the yeah. Bible. Cool. Um, my mother's mother, my grandmother, was a very, she was a nurse back in the 1930s, 40s, and she was a very um, colorful, very colorful uh, woman. And she would babysit for my brother and I at, at times. And I remember she would call us Pascunyaks. Yep. Did you deserve it? No, of course not. We were little kids. We'll ask Marilyn about that. <laughs> Marilyn from the other room. Yes, he deserves it. <laughs> um, if I could just say, and Wikipedia will establish this too, Pinchas with a kuf is the notebook of the community. Correct. Pinchas with a chet, chet. is the guy in the Torah. Yeah. Very good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I'm going to send you, you know, Sholem Aleichem's mm -hmm. mother died. His father remarried, and the stepmother treated um, Sholem Aleichem and his siblings very badly. And she would... Um, she would use all these Yiddish curses, and um, I have uh, I have a list of them that I'm going to send you um, via email, and you can distribute them. Okay. And they're in uh, they're in English, and they're in Yiddish. Thank you. And I'm going to send it to you. Any other questions before? Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Lots of things I've never even thought about. Can you bring some more curse words for next time, too? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be. Sandy, you're taking a list. Cushions are better. Yeah, that way I can uh, actually increase yeah. my knowledge of Yiddish those, since my mother didn't want me to know it. <laughs> the good stuff. Erin, you want me to give you a list of the ones <laughs> I got from my house? Yes. <laughs> like the Vilta Helania. <laughs> Which is a wild man, wild horse. A wild horse, yeah. A built a Now, well, they deny you from making. Yeah, built a high as a wild man. Built a high as a wild beast. Yeah. Wild beast. Okay, all you built a high as. See you next week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, right, everybody. Have a good week, Thanks everyone. Thank you. you. I come to put it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. Sherry Ann, Bye. thank you. You're welcome. Y'all have a great rest of the Thanks, week. Thanks, Sherry Ann. Thank pleasure. you, Sherry Ann. My pleasure.